fundamentally everything we should be doing or uh, yeah, that we ought to be doing should be to enhance the human experience by nature, right? If, if we're not doing it for that reason, what, what reason are we doing it in the first place? And, and, and I think that's, uh, I'm guessing in, in some ways at, at, at the very, you know, macro level, that's the invitation that this book invites being like, what the hell are we doing? It's like, yes, there's ways that digital technology can complement and enhance the experience, but it, it can never be a replacement for. Exactly. And, and I think we would sort of like playing with those notions and they would be dismissed as, oh, well, well, this is the way of the future. You know, you, you don't want to be left behind. You know, this is the way things are going. But all of a sudden, when it was such a stark contrast that all we had was the diet of digital of what it could supply us for a good reason, right? We weren't allowed out of our houses for, you know, months at a time. Um, we very clearly saw the limits of that most human experience that we could not get the things we wanted, even from an innocuous activity, such as going to the grocery store. You know, we couldn't get the things we wanted out of that online. We could get the bananas. We could get the chicken nuggets and the eggs and all those things. They'd be brought to our door. Really convenient. My God, that was easy. We saved a lot of time. Maybe we even saved some money. But we couldn't get all the other things that we didn't even realize we thought we wanted. You know, I was in a grocery store in Toronto last Monday, shopping for this canoe trip that I'd gone on with my friend Toby. And we were in the tea aisle looking at teas. And there was an old uh, woman, old Italian grandmother who was in this, it's an Italian grocery store called Fiesta Farms. And it, she was in this thing and she was asking us in kind of a, you know, her, her best English, like looking at different sleep time teas and saying, you know, will this work? Will this help me? And we're like, oh, well, yeah. My friend's like, yeah, this is a good sleep time to you. She's like, yeah, you know, my husband died recently and I haven't been able to sleep. And I just want something to like help me relax and go to sleep, right? That was nothing to do with a transaction for the best tea. She wasn't going to go on Amazon and read reviews of eight celestial seasoning sleepy time teas to find which one had the best chance of giving her a relaxing thing. That wasn't what she wanted. She was in that space in her community as a woman who was feeling broken and alone and vulnerable as a human being. And these two random idiots were there trying to talk to her about tea. And she wanted to tell them about the pain and hurt that she was going through as a human. And we had a very human moment where we, you know, patted her back and told her it would be okay. And, you know, tried to pick the best tea for her. That's a moment that I don't think I'll ever forget. And that's such a human part of our world. I hope a part of our future that we didn't realize we were doing away with when we were just trying to put groceries online. And so I think this experience is something I hope we we can learn from, right? What's the whole point of doing A-B testing if you don't then take the information and learn from it? You know, it would be a waste if we then said, well, that didn't work, but let's charge forward and we're going to build, you know, a better exercise bike online. It's like, maybe that's not the solution. Maybe the solution is we have that, but, you know, we, we, we still want to make sure that we have enough bike lanes for kids to be able to go out and, and ride outside and learn what it's actually like or, or have gyms where people not only go to get exercise and spin their legs really fast on a bike, but like they meet friends, they feel better about themselves. They maybe meet romantic partners. They change their body image of themselves because they're out in the world and with this other group of people. You know, there's so much more to life than just the, the parts that we think we're looking at. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, it was beautiful. And I think uh, a good reminder uh, of, of why this is a really important conversation. Last week uh, on the way home, I was listening to a podcast, the, the Lex Friedman podcast, Friedman Friedman, however you pronounce it. And they had Ray Kurzweil on the renowned futurist Ray Kurzweil. The singular futurist, as we shall call. Yes, uh, who is predicting that the singularity um, will occur somewhere around 2029 is his prediction. <laughs> uh, I wish everybody could have seen that. Um, you know, and 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 I, I think the reason this is a particularly important conversation is because in some ways what Ray Kurzweil is predicting, uh, I mean, maybe he's a prophet from the future, um, <laughs> feels like an inevitability. But um, 
You just made a gesture with your hand uh, that I won't repeat for uh, censorship purposes, but um, who censors this? It's a podcast. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, there although, are literally Nazis are making of- podcasts out there, Ronan. I made a tuggy tuggy motion with my hand when he mentioned the singular. All right, there we go. Thank you. Um, what inspired that response? You know, there is a blindness to the certainty of someone like Mr. Kurzweil, who's a brilliant inventor and thinker that past financial and technological success equals, you know, a unfailing vision of the future, that he is a prophet, right? If you go to Times Square, there are people standing there with signs talking about how the world will die or the Lord will come back or the Mashiach is returning in the next year. Repent, repent, repent. Who have just a firm belief in their own messianic future as Ray Kurzweil or other, you know, techno futurists, um, singularity believers, techno utopians, whatever you want to call them, believing that our future is tied up. And destiny is going to be dictated by the convergence of AI and VR and, you know, a couple of other, I don't know, acronyms. But again, all of that ignores the reality of the human experience and what humans actually want. Like, oh, you know, in five years, computers are going to be so good to talk to that, you know, you're going to have a chatbot that's going to be able to emote and empathize with that poor woman in the grocery store. That woman doesn't want a fucking chatbot. That's not the future she wants. She wants people to talk to her. She wants someone to comfort her. That's what gives her meaning. That's what gives all of us meaning. And so this messianic dogmatic belief in digital technology as our salvation is is no different from any other sort of messianic dogmatic belief in some sort of future, whether it's, you know, heaven or hell, right? And I think for so long, while the world of business and the world of sort of mainstream culture has not really paid much credo credence to the messianic pronunciations of religions, right? No one's saying, oh, we're, you know, we better, we better base our five-year forecast for um this, you know, large CPG company on uh, the Mormon, you know, prophecy or the Aztec calendar or whatever. No one's doing that. Um, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, I, I went to a conference and and I saw Ray Kurzweil and he said that in, you know, six years, robots are going to be driving us um, everywhere. So we're, we're going to abandon our, our human dri- drivers on our, our transit program in the city. 